about the Word of God. And uh, here's our context. Um, <clears throat> the Lord is speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. The nation of Israel is in a time of decline. His heart's broken over their condition, and he goes to God, and God says, I want to talk to you um, about what I'm able to do, what I'm able to do with the nation, what I'm able to do with individuals. He said, but I need you to go down to the potter's house and just sit and just watch the potter, and then I'm going to talk to you. So this is, this is that account in the 18th chapter of Jeremiah, beginning of verse 1. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, go down at once to the potter's house. I will speak to you further there. And so I went down to the potter's house, and I found him working at his wheel. Now and then, there would be something wrong with the pot that he was molding from the clay that was in his hand. And so he would rework the clay into another kind of pot as he saw fit. And then the Lord's message came to me. The King James says that um, the clay or the pot in the potter's hand was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again. And I, in this instance, I actually like the, the uh, New Living Translation. It says, but the jar that he was making did not turn out as he had hoped it would. Have you ever felt like that? I don't think I'm turning out like God hoped that I would. So he says, the pot didn't turn out as, as the Lord hoped it would, so he crushed it into another lump. Oh, praise God, isn't that something we all look forward to. Crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. <clears throat> now, I always thought it was really odd that the hands of a living God are on your life and they're molding you, and yet as he molds you, there's defects, there's flaws, and he has to remake you. So the message from the potter's house has to do with God's ability and his determination to perfect us beyond our failures. God's forming of your life is going to reveal your flaws. The process of God making you into what he wants you to do and what he wants you to be is going to show up what he doesn't want you to be and what he doesn't want you to do. That's all going to come out. So remember that God's choosing you and he has you on the potter's wheel, not because of your ability, but because of your pliability. Because your heavenly potter possesses the ability to remake a marred pot. That was the lesson at the, at the, father's, at the potter's house. God can remake a marred pot. So don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged. God isn't finished with you yet. Stay on the wheel. That's the message. It's a lifetime of being on the wheel. And I remember 2 Corinthians that says we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power is from God and not of us. So he's looking for the pliability more than the ability within our life. So this, this part of the message, I wanted to deal with what are the two hands that the potter has? He's got a right hand and a left hand, but... But God has two very distinct hands, and those hands are the blood and the Word of God. In Revelation 19, there's a vision of Jesus, and he comes on a white horse. And the Bible says that uh, he is riding on that white horse, and he is called faithful and true. He is called faithful and true. And I think the faithfulness speaks of the blood, the blood of Jesus that he gave was his faithfulness to fulfill that, that blood covenant and love us to the point of shedding his blood and giving his life for us. And then he is called true, the word of God. So he is faithful and true. And the true obviously represents the word. So you see that the two distinguishing characteristics of Jesus when he's seen on that white horse leading the armies of God, leading you and I, in heaven, those two distinct uh, qualities show up, the blood and the word. And we remember in Revelation 11, it says, We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. So, at the Last Supper, Jesus lifts up the communion elements. And at the Last Supper, he institutes the new covenant meal. And he does it to clarify the focus on his blood 
and on his word as the two agents, the two elements through which the Holy Spirit works in your life. So I want to be very specific this morning. The Holy Spirit doesn't just come in an abstract, in a nebulous kind of a way and operate through wishing and hoping, but God is, is very practical in the way that he deals with us. He touches us, he makes contact, he impacts us through the blood, which I shared about last week, and through the word, which I'm going to share about this morning. So that's his, those are his two hands. With the blood and the word, he forms, remakes, shapes our life. So when you're living <coughs> um, on the potter's wheel, Jesus' hands that, that are impacting you are the blood and the word. And the blood and the word always work together. The blood cleanses you from what you are, and the word makes you what you are not. Because we need both of those things. We need to be cleansed, and we also need to be remade. So the blood cleanses what we are, the word remakes what we are not. So now let's take a look at that other hand, the Word of God. Now I want to say specifically that the Word of God reshapes, takes the shape we're in and reshapes us into a vessel that's pleasing to Him. And that's what God's doing in your life. He's reshaping you into a vessel that is pleasing to Him. And I hope this morning, if nothing else, that you'll renew your faith and your desire to go to the Father and say, Lord, reshape me into what you want me to be. If you look at yourself and you see the flaws as you're on the potter's wheel and the ugliness from time to time and the dysfunction pops out, don't be discouraged. Say, Lord, you've got a goal. You see something in me and you're, you're wanting to form it and bring it. So I pray that you'll, you'll do that. And what I want to share with you this morning is how you can take the Word of God in your life and allow the hand of God to shape and to make you, specifically make you what you are not. Now, we're all familiar with in 1 John, excuse me, in the first chapter of John, how that the description of Jesus says he is the Word. Somebody help me. He is the Word made flesh. That is one of the most stunning statements of the Bible. The Word was made flesh. And He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, the Creator Word, the one that spoke, let there be light, the one who spoke the universe into existence, the one who upholds the entire universe by the word of His authority, the Creator Word spoke Himself into the womb of a virgin, Mary, and the Word became flesh. That is how Mary came to be a virgin, yet pregnant with a child. And Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Specifically, he was the Word speaking himself into Mary's womb and the Word became flesh. And the Bible says that when we saw him, now understand when we saw Jesus, when you read the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're seeing his flesh, the humanity. You're seeing him. But in seeing him, and in hearing the words that he spoke and, and seeing the acts that he performed, you are hearing and seeing the word of God. And the Bible says it's glorious. God's glory is the fact that his word becomes flesh. And that's what God's trying to do in your life. He's trying to make your flesh glory in the word of God. And so we beheld the glory which was the Word manifest in the flesh. Now, why is that important? Well, it's probably important for a number of reasons, but, but one I'll just bring out is that <clears throat> Jesus didn't just come and speak brilliant ideas. He manifest 
the Word. They saw in Him. In fact, the reason why Jesus used tiny little phrases. Think of how you and I pray. We pray a half hour over somebody for a headache. Jesus said, okay, and the headache was gone. Okay, the dude raised from the dead. Very few words. Why? Because he was the word made flesh. That was the glory. That Jesus wasn't just like an electronic conductor receiving the word and speaking it out. He was the word tabernacling in human form. That gives us hope because if if he is God's gift of life to us, then what we are receiving is not the right to speak the word of God, but to be the word of God. Hallelujah. We receive through the new birth the right to be restructured and reformed by the actual word of God. So the word of God must have a continuing impact on your soul if it's going to shape your life. The worst thing a Christian can do is to run through the Bible and say, well, I've memorized a lot of this and I've read a lot of it and I actually really like a lot of what I've read in here. I don't know about some of it. And just treat it on a mental level. Even if you're assenting and agreeing to what it is that you're reading, that's not letting it impact your soul. That is simply treating the Word of God as another idea. Now maybe you think, maybe in your mind it's the best of ideas, but it's still being handled only mentally as a thought or as an idea. Jesus was full of glory and truth because that's what brought forth his flesh and that's how deep God wants to work in your life. I want to encourage you to expect that miracle in your life. That is what being born again is. It's not God saving you because you agree with him. That's the trouble that Christians have. They think if I agree with the Bible, then the Lord's going to like me. And I'll get to go to be with him. When I pray, he'll, he'll listen to me because I like his word. No, 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 no. The reason Jesus came was not so that you could agree with him, but so that you could be born again. Amen. So, the word of God must have a continuing impact on your soul in order to shape your life. Remember, we're talking about the potter's wheel, and God is shaping you with the word of God. So, it's, it's obviously got to impact the clay of your life and change your form, change what your behavior looks like, what your speech sounds like. God wants to reform you into a vessel that he has called you to be. There is no power on the face of the earth, and there's no person, there's no institute, there's no university, there's no experience that can bring that kind of change. The leopard cannot change its spots. You are what you are. Period, dot, end of sentence. You can get polished. You can put on different clothes. You can do makeup. You can go through a cosmetic change. But only the potter can remake the marred clay. So in order for grace and truth, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. He wants to give that grace, which is God's ability and truth. He wants to give that grace and truth to you to reshape your life. In order for that to happen, the Word of God must go beyond being a thought that you agree with, and it must become the truth that shapes your behavior. In other words, you have to do what you're learning. It's got to work itself in you so that you start doing it, and not just thinking it and agreeing with it. One of my favorite verses that really brings out the dynamic of what I just said is, found where Paul speaks to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, and he says, And we also thank God continually for this, that when you received the message of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of mere men, but as it truly is the word of God, which is effectually at work in you who believe exercising its supernatural power in those who adhere to, trust in, and rely upon it. I love that verse. 
He says, you Thessalonians, when I brought the message of God, you received it as the word of God, which it is, and it is effectually working in you. Think of the word effectual. How many of you are effectual at what you do? Some of us are more effectual than others at what we do. The more we work at it, we become more effectual. The effectualness of anything is how well we do it. How do you measure how well you do what you do is you reach your goal. You accomplish what it is you're aiming at. So the Bible says the Word of God is effectually working in you. Well, the word working, supported by the idea of effectual working, is the Greek word energio. And guess what English word? Energy. That's right. You know, I don't even want to step off into the topic of energy in America today. What an absolutely, here I go, I said I wasn't going to stop off. <laughs> but the fools are running the plantation. And this battle over energy, there is one energy source, however, it's indisputable. It is effective, it is eternal, it is limitless, and that is the Word of God. And the scripture says that the Word of God is energized in you. Why was the Word of God creating effective energy in the Thessalonians? Because they received it as the Word of God and not just simply other ideas. Now, we need to break down what does it mean that the Thessalonians received it as the Word of God. How did they receive it? How did they receive that Word? For God to provide you with His effective energy, you must eat the Word. You must eat the flesh that the word, the eternal word, produced. Jesus said, my flesh is the word of God. The word became flesh, and you must eat my flesh. In fact, in John 6, Jesus lost most of his disciples in one little message that he gave about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. The Bible says most of his disciples, except for the 12, got up and walked away. They were totally appalled. Everything he was saying and everything he was doing was great up until that point when he said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And they were flipped out. How ghastly, how offensive. Eat your flesh, drink your blood. But of course, Jesus was speaking on a spiritual level. You know, I have found that if you don't want to understand, you won't. Most people are confused, not because they're dumb, but because they don't want to understand. Now, I'm a hard nose about this, and I know a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters don't agree with me, and it, it may be why I'm not as effective at reaching people, but I'm a little hard nose about the fact that if you don't get it somewhere, you don't want to get it. If you want to understand something, you'll claw your way to that door. If you really want to hear You'll listen until you get it. People that, that don't get it didn't want to get it in most cases. So at any rate, um, in John chapter 6, I'm going to read this to you because I think you need to hear everything, at least most of it. I'm going to leave some of it out that Jesus said about eating the word or eating his flesh. I am the living bread, the word made flesh that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I offer so the world may live is my flesh. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise that person up at the last day. For anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I abide in him. So you, could, you might be able to see why they were a little offended at what he was saying. Um, however, just like your body lives on food, your soul lives on words. Words are the food for your soul, just like whatever food you happen to eat 
feeds your body, so words feed your soul. When Jesus offered, now Jesus said, I will offer my body for the life of the world, to give life to the world. He is thinking my body is the, is the incarnate word of God. So I'm not saying I'm going to carve up my physical body and everybody's going to get a little piece. He's not even saying through the little wafers at the communion meal that represent my body that those are what's going to give you life. No, he's saying what produced my flesh is the word of God. And I am going to allow you to eat my word. My gospel is the bread of life. And I'm going to feed the world with the gospel. Praise the Lord. So <clears throat> when your mind is on a truth diet, now some of us, we need, to, we need to tighten up the belt. I definitely need to put my natural body on a truth diet. But many of us need to go back to a little stricter truth diet. You know, we need to put our mind on a truth diet. And when your mind is on a truth diet, when you are eating his flesh, when you are eating the word of God, there are a couple of things in the scriptures that I read to you that automatically are produced in your life. So when you let that hand of the word shape your, your life by, by feeding daily on the word of God, um, you end up being full of grace and truth. That's one benefit. Another one is you have eternal life and the Lord will raise you up at the last day. Another one is that Jesus will abide in you. He'll live in you. You won't be spending your life trying to chase Jesus. The devil will never be able to tell you that he isn't yours. But when you eat the word, when you eat the, the flesh of God's word, when it becomes flesh within you, you eat the word of God, Jesus abides in you and you abide in him. You all often, if you're around me when we're praising God, you'll oftentimes hear that, uh, hear me quote Psalm um, 34 and 8. Thank you. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Blessed is the person that takes their refuge in Him. How can I see that God is good? How can I see that he's good in my life? I want to see the goodness of God in my life. Uh, many times we can see the goodness out there in other people's lives. I want to see the goodness in my life. That's really what the psalmist is talking about. But in order to see the goodness, are you eating the word? The Bible says, taste and you will see. Taste. Some of you are trying to see the goodness of God. You're not eating the word. And... And some of you that I'm saying this to know the Bible, have read it 27 times, can quote a whole bunch of it. So eating the word is not just knowing a lot of Bible verses or having quite a supply of Bible knowledge at your fingertips. It is the continual impression of God's word daily throughout the day upon your mind, shaping your thoughts, impacting your behavior. That's different than knowing a whole bunch of verses. So taste and see what? That the Lord is good. Here are a few of the good things that you will see in your life if you truly allow that hand of God to impact. If you taste the word, you'll see, for example, in John 15, 7, the Bible says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you will ask anything that you want and it will be done for you. Wow. Answered prayer. That's a good thing. Praise the Lord. I'd like to see that. Psalm 119 and verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Wow, I'm, I've been having problems sinning against the Lord lately. I can't seem to break out of it. What is, this, what is the good thing that will deliver me out of that? Hide the word in your heart. We're getting down to how you do that. We're talking about eating the word. In, in John 17, in Jesus' intercessory prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he prays for his disciples and by extension for you and I, he says, sanctify them, which means set them apart. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 
As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. The Lord intended those two thoughts to go together. We often separate them. We quote, as I have been sent in the world, I send the disciples into the world. But it's an extension of him saying, separate, sanctify them through your word. Your word is truth. Then send them into the world. Because the Lord can't keep us from the evil while he sends us into the midst of the evil unless the word is working in our life. That's what keeps us sanctified. We're not sanctified because we escape the world. We're not sanctified because we run away from the world. That's how America's gotten into the mess that we're in today. It's because the church wasted its, so much of its valuable teaching and time trying to get its people to withdraw from the world. And the devil just said, oh, that's exactly what I want the church to do. That Jesus said, I don't want them withdrawing. I want them in the middle of the world, but they are not going to be able to do that and survive if they don't sanctify the word of God within their hearts. That's what will keep the world from closing in on them and, and influencing them. Another one is in Romans 10, 17. Most of you know, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Wow, that's another good thing I can expect. As I eat the word of God, it will produce faith in me. Um, Psalm 119, verse 5, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. One of the other good things we're, we receive as a benefit is it becomes clear to us the direction that the Lord wants us to go. You know, when somebody is corrupted and their behavior manifests the fact that there's something wrong with their mind, their thinking, they've become corrupt, we usually say their mind's been poisoned. How many of you have heard that before? Their mind has been poisoned. Why are those people, why are they, why are they doing that on TV? Why do those people act like that? Why, why is this happening? Why are my kids going bonkers? Into, their mind has been poisoned. Someone has poisoned their mind. Behavior like that doesn't just spring up. It comes from a poisoned mind. Like I said, your body eats food and lives off of food, but your mind lives off of words. Someone has said some poisonous words to that person, and now their behavior is corrupt and poison. So just like your body, when your mind ingests words, it lives out those words. So if you ingest lies, your soul's going to get sick. If you ingest food that's uh, filled with, with uh, bad things for you, your body's going to get sick. And that's why we see even Christians, if you could see sinners, for example, let's just start there. If you could see sinners in the spirit, you're, you're not seeing them in the flesh, you're seeing them in the spirit. You would see dark, gaunt, dead, some more dead than others, withered, raisin-faced, pockmarked with disease. You'd see people walking, just waiting to fall over. That's what being dead in sin is. But when you look at believers, you see a light, you see radiance, you see life even though they have imperfections. But oftentimes when you look at Christians, sometimes you see a lot of acne, some boils, a limp, weakness. Christians walk around with spiritual sickness. Why? Because they eat words that make their soul sick. So while they have the truth of God in them and the foundation of the gospel is in them, they believe it, they receive it, in the potter's hands, they're marred. Do you follow what I'm saying? God's working them, but these, these distortions are showing up. How did they get there? They're listening to stuff that's making their soul sick. One of my, um, one of, one of my favorite Old Testament verses is in Isaiah 55, and it says, why do you spend your money on food that does not give you strength? I sometimes think of that if I'm tempted to cruise into Dunkin' Donuts. 
because I'm hungry. I think, you know, this might fill my hunger for a moment, but I'm going to regret eating this. And it's just going to make me, you know, bloat me up and make me need to take a nap or something. Why do you spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me. Notice how God starts. The healing already starts. Listen. Why? Because the soul eats what it listens to. That's why Jesus said in the parable of the sower, be careful who you listen to. Be careful what you listen to. Listen to me. Why do you pay good money for food that makes you sick? Listen to me, and by listening to me, you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, and I will give you all the unfailing love that I promised to David. Wow, look at the promise, look at that. How can I have the unfailing love that was promised to David? And remember who David was. David was the man who slept with Bathsheba and her husband killed. We're not glorifying his faux pas, his faults, or his sins. Uh, he was grievously broken after that sin before the Lord. But that's who David was, and yet the Bible says that God promised to him unfailing love. So God's not promising unfailing love to you because you're perfect, but because you're pliable. He wants to give you that love. He wants that love to, to lift you up and cause you to rebound from your failures. And when you fall flat on your face and you make mistakes, not to stay there, not to let the devil drag you off into a backslidden state, but get up back in the race and run. How do you do that? Listen to me. Listen to me. Don't listen to your mama. Don't listen to your uncle. Don't listen to deacon so-and-so. Don't listen to the dude on the radio. Don't listen to your own crazy mind that you've been poisoning with nutty words. Listen to me, God said, and I will feed you with the everlasting covenant. I will raise you up. I'll take that sickness out of you. I'll bring health back into you. I will give you my unfailing love. Now let me tell you today, it's been over 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead, and the resurrected Jesus is still feeding us his word. When we come to Jesus, we say, help Jesus, what does he do? He sends us to the word. He's still teaching us and speaking the word. He hasn't flipped from being the speaker or the word made flesh to now being just magic Jesus. But he is still the word made flesh and he's still speaking the word to us. One of the greatest examples of this was the two disciples on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was crucified. They, they still didn't believe that he had raised, risen from the dead. And these two guys were depressed and they're dragging along the Emmaus road and they're talking to one another and they're all depressed while they're talking. Jesus shows up and he walks up to them and he joins them as they're walking. They don't know that it's Jesus, right? How many of you remember the story? Two disciples on the Emmaus road. And so the, we, script, we picked that scripture up in Luke 24 and 17. And if you read the whole thing from verse 17 to 32, I'll just grab a couple excerpts. Jesus walks up to them and he says, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still and looked sad. So he says, what is this thing you're talking about as you walk together? And the Bible says they stopped walking and they stood there and they just went like that. They just were depressed and Jesus is looking at them and not knowing that it was Jesus, they began to tell him about everything that had happened to him and how he'd been betrayed and how the Jews had crucified him. And they said to him this phrase, after they said he, he was healing people and, and, uh, and they, they crucified him, and we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. That was, the, the, that was how they summed it up. So they had really been talked out of everything. 
They were totally deflated. What, what talked them out? Their mind had been spending days feasting on the events that had taken place. Their mind had lost its focus on all that Jesus had said. And so their heart was sick, and they were depressed, and they had given up that he was the Messiah. We had hoped that he was the Messiah. So Jesus, at this point, interrupts them, and he says, Now, if you think I'm rough, Jesus loves you. He is love, and he is rough sometimes. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Notice he directs them back to the Word. He doesn't say, why didn't you listen to me? He said, why didn't you listen to the Word? Oh, foolish and slow of heart. Notice he says the problems in your mind, problems in your heart. Slow of heart. Why were they bogged down? Why were they slow at heart? Because they had been eating a lot of sick words, a lot of sick food, had gotten in there and clogged up the gears, right? Oh, foolish, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things? He's talking about himself in the third person. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So that must have taken a while as they're walking along. And he's starting with Moses. He's preaching through all the scriptures himself to them. They still don't know it's him. And he's not saying, I am him. They go to, they go to their, their house. They invite him for dinner. At dinner, he breaks bread and their eyes are open. They see that it's Jesus and poof, he vanishes from before them. Listen to what they said. Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Didn't our hearts burn as Jesus preached the scriptures to us? Even Jesus preaches the word. When your heart is discouraged, Jesus is going to give you the gospels. I'm sorry, that is so ridiculous. I, I shouldn't have said that. He is going to give you those pills that are going to make it better. He will speak the healing word to you. He doesn't, that's what drives me nuts about a lot of the goofy Christian songs I hear today about kissing Jesus and all sorts of stupid stuff people write about. I'm thinking to myself, good God, the Bible isn't good enough anymore as a resource for songs. We've got to reach into contemporary culture and come up with stupid ideas, you know, and serve up. Jesus did not reason with them and say, gosh, you know, you, I, I thought you were my friends. You could have stayed a little more faithful to me and and, uh, you know, weren't you impressed at the way? I, he didn't reason with them about himself. It, he never became personal in that way. He always, he kept sending them back to the Word. And what did they say? Wow, he hit us with a blowtorch. Our hearts were on fire. What was doing that? The Word was doing that. Amen. The Word was doing that. That's right. I'm going to close with this. The, uh, the Holy Spirit will shape you into the Word of God that you feed on. That's just the Holy Spirit, the hands of God, the blood and the Word, will shape you into the Word that you feed on. And I want to give you a closing scripture I'm going to read to you out of Galatians that is a beautiful example of the Holy Spirit doing just that. This is what you can expect. If you'll feed on the Word of God, Paul shares the contrast between if you don't feed on the Word and if you do feed on the Word, what kind of a life you're going to live. Galatians 5, 16 through 23. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another 
so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. He just kind of <laughs> throws the whole circle open. And things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is, the fruit that the Spirit is molding in your life, performing, developing in you, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against these things there is no law. What a contrast. What a contrast. If you feed off of the world that huge list, that's what you're going to end up doing. Some of those things. If you feed off the word of God, love, joy, peace, all those qualities, you're going to be molded into those kind of qualities. So I'd like you to turn off your device or close your Bible. We're going to pray. And I think the way we should respond to this this morning is to, is to number one, realize that God is trying to get control, help you get control of your life by getting up on the potter's wheel and letting him mold you through the blood. I did encourage you to listen to last week's message about how that works. And the word of God. I'll let the word of God like the Thessalonians, be the authority in your life. Hear it. Let it mold your thinking until it becomes your behavior. And God will supernaturally drive out those fleshy practices, the fornication, the strife, outbursts of anger, all those things. God will drive them out. You've been trying to get rid of them. You can't do it, can you? It's just like fighting with a wild monkey. It's all over you. Not that I have experience with that, but I've, I've seen it on TV. And so you can't defeat those things. But if you will feast on the Word, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will cause you to triumph. You'll stand up in love. You will walk in peace because your mind will begin to be dominated by the Word of God takes a decision. And sometimes <clears throat> you have to preach to yourself. I've always said you're the most important prophet you're ever going to hear. You will believe your own preaching quicker than you'll believe anyone else's. So preach to yourself. Get the word of God, meditate on it, and then speak it constantly. Speak it out of your mouth. Speak it over your life. I need to do more of that myself. Praise the Lord. And when I see those weaknesses manifest in me. I know where they come from. Lack of the word. That's all there is to it. It's just I need to get back into the word and let that word develop me.